Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today we're back out at Duelist Den, and we're going to be shooting this replica of a second model brown bass. Now this gun is made by David Pedersoli in Italy, and he's represented here in the United States by the Italian Firearms Group. Now this is an interesting gun, this is my first time having it out. Uh, of course, it was the British infantry weapon for almost the entire 18th century and into the 19th century. So in that time it underwent a lot of changes and the weapon used by Lord Wellington's troops in the Peninsula Campaign differs quite a bit from the ones used by Braddock at the Monongahela. So let's talk about that a little bit. Well, the Brown Bess musket first entered the British service in 1722, and it remained in service until 1838. So that's well over 100 years. It has to be one of the longest serving um, firearms in any army's history. It's, it's a pretty incredible service life. And of course it changed quite a bit over that time period. So, you know, as I said, the guns that were used in the French and Indian War were quite a bit different from the uh, guns used in the, in the Napoleonic War. And what we've got here is a second model brown bess. The short land pattern musket. This particular model, this replica, is based on a model of the 1760s. Uh, and therefore it's, it's appropriate to the American Revolutionary War. It's not really appropriate to the French and Indian War, though it gets used all the time, but I'll, I'll tell you the differences there. Now, this gun is, is pretty historically accurate. Um, there are really only two issues with it for the 1762 model. That is, it's signed by William Grice and dated 1762 on the lock. And the last time that was done is in the marine model of 1759. So these later 18th century models would have just said tower on the lock or nothing at all. So that is a bit of an anachronism. The other issue is the distance on the, uh, the butt from the heel to the toe. This should be at least a quarter of an inch longer. And that gives the buttstock kind of a truncated appearance. Uh, so it actually should sweep down farther, really about to here. And, and that would make a big difference to the look of the gun. So that's something that I wish that they would improve. Now, a lot of you have told me that you're really interested in seeing the comparison of the, uh, the replica guns, in this case of Pedersoli, to the originals to see how close they are. And I understand that. And I fully intend to do that with this Pedersoli. I've got a brown bess, an original brown bess on the way. Uh, unfortunately, it did not arrive in time for this first video, but eventually, if you'll be patient, uh, you will see the Pedersoli side by side with an actual brown bess musket, and we can see how they stack up. Okay, but let's take the Pedersoli and give you the tail of the tape on it. Um, this is based on the short land pattern musket. It has a, uh, a 41 and three quarter inch barrel. And the caliber is 0.75. Uh, it takes 11 gauge components if you want to shoot it with shot. And we'll probably be doing that in the future video. So you might be able to get by with 12 gauge, but they're going to be a little bit loose. But 11 gauge, be a tiny bit on the tight side and give you a better seal should you want to use um, you know you want to use things like 19th century wads and uh, cards now this gun weighs in at nine pounds it's no lightweight and to put that in perspective the m16 service rifle weighs about six and a half pounds and the world war ii m1 grand weighed about nine and a half pounds so this gun is kind of at the top of the uh, top of the scale as far as weight goes for service rifles. Okay, well, this will be the first time that I shoot this uh, this Pedersoli Brown Bess. I'm going to be loading it 
with paper cartridges the way it would have been loaded in the 18th century. And I really want to know what it can do with viable 18th century ammunition. So, if you saw last week's video, you saw me make up a bunch of these paper cartridges. This one has the priming in it as well. So, let's show you the loading technique for the 18th century. You would have first placed the gun on half cock, bit off the tail of the paper cartridge, and fill the pan with the same 2FG powder that is going into the main charge. Then you'd close the frizzin. Now, I don't like doing that because it's, I think, a fairly unsafe way to load, but it's the way that they did load. So then you take the cartridge with the rest of the powder charge in it, and you would pour that powder charge directly down the bore. Right, so you get all the powder down. Now the last step was to take that cartridge with the ball, right, entirely, put it in the bore with the cartridge paper acting as a wadding, load it down, and now you were ready to fire. So let's see how it does. Okay, well we've got the gun loaded and primed with paper cartridges. And by the way, if you're interested in the load or what's in the cartridges or why I'm doing it this way, last week's video was all about making paper cartridges for the Brown Best Musket. And it explains all of that. So go ahead and look up last week's video. And that way I won't have to repeat it for those of you who have seen it. So I've never shot this. What I want to do is take five shots on a 25-yard target and just see where it's heading and then figure out what to do after that. So let's get to shooting. Okay, that's five. Like I said, the trigger pull on this thing is horrendous, eight or nine pounds. Uh, so there's, there's no babying it to touch it off, but let's go see how we did. Well, I think we could all agree that at 25 yards, that gun's a killer. And that is despite the fact that that trigger is horrendous. But I've got three in the target. Uh, basically, everything is a killing shot. So, you know, everything is good. I mean, the, the gun went off quickly despite the low touch hole. I, I tried to be careful how I primed it, but uh, it was quite reliable and quite accurate. Okay, here's what I mean about the uh, position of the touch hole. And this is a problem, I have to say, that I've run into in a number of Pedersoli long guns. So. Pierre Angelo, if you see this video, take a look at this. This is something uh, I would really like to see you address. The touch hole is too low in the pan. Now, my lines aren't perfectly straight because I drew them freehand, but if you draw a line across the top of the pan, the bottom of the touch hole should be touching that line. Okay? that's the best case that's called the sunrise position now if the touch hole is centered on that line that's fine too if the touch hole is below that line uh, which is the case here well then you can easily cover up the touch hole with your priming powder and that's not a good thing you want the flash of the priming powder to jump into that touch hole you don't want to burn it in like a fuse. That's what people always say, oh, your guns go off so fast. Well, that's because the touch hole's positioned right and they're primed right. So I'm taking a little bit of extra care to prime lightly on these so that I'm not covering up the touch hole. But, of course, it's hard with a military gun. So that is something that I'm actually thinking 
about drilling out that touch hole, tapping it, and plugging it, and uh, drilling a new touch hole in the right position. Uh, so I, I may end up doing that in the future, but so far it has been running very well. And I'm not going to mess with success. Well, Evil Roy has accepted a French commission, and it looks like he's leading a raiding party of disgruntled Delaware warriors against the settlers of Blymeyer's Hollow. So we'll just have to get the militia together and see if we can stop them. And that's the end of Evil Roy's depredations. Well, if you're going to be shooting military cell paper cartridges, the easiest way to transport them and, and have them ready for loading is to use a cartridge box. And that's the way they would have done it in the 18th century. And that's the way I was doing it for this video. And uh, my friend Michael Williams was good enough to loan me a selection of uh, cartridge boxes, uh, which he made just to illustrate this video. So you see here three types. There's a, a metal one and two leather ones. And the leather one at the bottom with the uh, the cartouche on it, uh, that's a belly box. Your belt actually threads through that. Uh, and those were very common in the military. And then the uh, leather one on top of that with the shoulder strap is an over-the-shoulder one. That would be a militia-type bag. And they all have a similar characteristic. Uh, which is inside of them there's a wooden block that's drilled with holes that are the appropriate size to hold the paper cartridge. And that holds the cartridges secure, uh, but it also makes it easy for you to grab that paper tail, pull them out, and load them. And um, if you're gonna if you're gonna shoot paper cartridges, I recommend that you either get or make one of these. So I noticed after the first three rounds this was getting hard to load. That should not be the case. So, <clears throat> before it's next outing, I'm going to polish the bore, see if that helps. But uh, right now I've got about six shots through it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a fast clean, put a few more rounds through. So, I've got the ramrod, and the end of the ramrod is threaded. And I picked up from Track of the Wolf. this little toe worm and it fits those threads on the end of the ramrod. So there you go, which turns this into a cleaning rod. So I've got a ball of toe, T-O-W, and toe is just unprocessed flax fibers. Okay, so give me a sec. All right, so this can is just a mixture of uh, water and ballastol. One part ballast all, nine parts water. I'm just going to wet that toe down with it. And I'm going to use this to swab the bore. Okay, see how it's nice and filthy with that black powder fouling. So, now I'm going to switch this out for some dry toe, and I'm just going to do it a few times until everything is dried up, and then I'll shoot it again. Okay, I'm going to use the brown best to take out a gallon water jug. Uh, it's positioned 25 yards away. So, wish me luck. I <laughs> got him. <laughs> well, that water jug went pretty well. So I think I'm going to take the Pedersoli Brown Bess. I'm going to load it with a paper cartridge and do my best to take out a honeydew melon. We'll see.
got it. <laughs> All right, that trigger is horrendous. The trick is to just pull it, some people say squeeze it, smoothly, but with a lot of strength. Don't try to baby it and touch it off. You gotta put your finger on it and just exercise your flex, but do it smoothly, smoothly back, and it'll, it'll go off and keep more they gotta go, as that honeydew demonstrates. Well, after a day of shooting it, I can share my impressions of the Petersoli Brown Bess musket, which is, overall, it's a very good gun. I've, I've had a lot of fun with it. Uh, the trigger pull is heavy, about eight or nine pounds, and that's, you know, that's common for a military gun of this period. You either work your way through it, or you can uh, adjust the sear. Well, we'll see what I do with it, but... Despite the heavy trigger, I hit everything I pointed it at. Uh, so it's really not that much of a detriment. It looks good. It has very few deviations from the originals, and those are things that I can live with, at least for, for a while. Despite complaining about the low touch hole, ignition was excellent. <clears throat> I didn't have a single misfire all day. Uh, I didn't have any hang fires, I didn't have any slow fires. I mean, you've seen it here on the video. I pull the trigger, it goes off. So I'm very happy about that. Uh, it fouled more quickly than I expected. I think I can deal with that, and, and we'll see. It just takes a little bit of elbow grease. And uh, if that works out, then I should be able to load this time after time. If not, I might have to go to a little bit smaller ball. I, I hate to do that, though, because this load is actually shooting very accurately. So, overall, I'm pretty happy. I'm going to do a little bit of work on it, and then we're going to move to uh, a couple of other steps. I'll, at some point, I'll shoot this with shot, and we'll see how it does with that. And at some point, I'm going to see how this would do as an individual skirmisher's weapon, uh, just like we did with my civilian smoothbore. I'm going to see how far I can get consistent hits on a man-sized target with it. So, I hope you liked the content today. If you did, thumbs up, right? You know, it's important. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, love to have you subscribe. And if you want to support us on Patreon, that's lovely. And if you don't, that's just fine. Uh, don't worry about it. Also, I've got my website, MikeBellaview.com, and we sell some neat merch there, so t-shirts or hoodie season. We're in kind of the crisp fall weather now. Uh, even coronavirus masks, because who knows how long we've got to do it, but when it's all over, there'll be collector's items, so go check it out. And stay tuned. I'll see you next week. Bye.